What had begun with an assassination in Sarajevo had grown into a continent-wide inferno involving dozens of countries. By 1917, after 20 million casualties, the war had mired into an unbreakable stalemate. In a desperate attempt to tilt the balance, Germany, which had earlier pledged not to interfere with American shipping, began a policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. Soon, three American ships were sunk. When President Woodrow Wilson learned of further German plans to entice Mexico into an alliance against the United States, he convened a special session of Congress. He asked for and received a declaration of war. It was soon apparent that the United States was not prepared for war. The regular army was too small, there were shortages of weapons and equipment. There was no air force. The country quickly became preoccupied with war preparations. In Kalamazoo, the war effort reached a fever pitch. It surprised everybody. Uh, there was a whole generation of people out there who simply refused to believe that a war of that scale was possible. People said, no, no, this is, the, this is the 19th century. This is the century when we've made so many improvements and developments uh, in technology and in medicine and in science. How could it po be possible that all the countries of the world would get together in a war uh, when uh, it sounds absolutely foolish and impossible? For many of the men who signed up to fight in World War I, I think that there was a lot of naivete, not knowing what they were getting themselves into. Common men, when they, and common people, I should say, when they are called to serve their country, can do uncommon things. Kalamazoo was the home of two National Guard companies, commanded by Colonel Joseph B. Westnedge. His father, Thomas, was a Civil War veteran from New York who had settled in Kalamazoo. His mother, Mary, was an accomplished artist. Joseph was born on August 16, 1872, at the family home on Lover's Lane, the third of four children. He and his older brother, Richard, both attended Kalamazoo College, where they were football stars. Westnich played the game of his life. Again and again, he stirred his noble men to greater work by his superb ground gaining and called forth the admiration of the assembled multitude. Kalamazoo College Index. That year, 1897, after his graduation, the local National Guard was activated and Joe, who had enlisted four years earlier, was sent to Florida for maneuvers during the Spanish-American War. The Guard operated under a system in which the men elected their own officers, and Joe was voted captain. The system was later abandoned, but because of his leadership abilities, Captain Westnedge retained his rank. With the end of the Spanish-American War, Kalamazoo's National Guard companies returned home and were mustered out of service. Joe entered the paper business, eventually becoming assistant manager of the Western Board and Paper Company. In 1900, he married Eva Sebring. They eventually had four children. The military had gotten in his blood, however, so he re-enlisted in the National Guard, remaining a captain. In 1916, in what was to be a dress rehearsal for World War I, the entire Michigan National Guard was called up to protect the border with Mexico after raids into the United States by the Mexican leader Pancho Villa. In January of 1917, they returned to Michigan as seasoned veterans, just in time for America's entrance into the Great War. On his return to Michigan, Captain Westnedge was promoted to colonel and was placed in charge of all the guard companies in southwestern Michigan. When the United States entered the war, he made a plea for enlistments. My wife had found a large portrait of a colonel and she brought home, she found it at a garage sale or someplace, and she said, I think this is Colonel Westnedge. It was kind of a mystic photo. And we took it down the historical side of that night. I knew that Cecil Southworth was going to be there, who'd served with the 126th Infantry, and had it laying face down. We weren't talking about the war or anything. The historical society meeting was meeting that night in the community center, which is in the center of our village. And I took the portrait and I lifted it up and I said, Cecil, 
who's this? And he said, that's him. He could hardly say it. He just gasped for breath. That's him. He didn't say Colonel Westage. He said him. And then he went on to tell his role in the war. And he said it was so ironic because when the 126 was mobilized, Colonel Joe made the rounds of all the towns and the communities. Sign up now. Go with us. And he said he came right here to Vicksburg, right outside that door. And he was standing up in a touring car. And he said, are you going to go to war? Go with Colonel Joe. Go with the boys you know. And he says, by gosh, that sounded like a good idea. And he said, I came in that door, and there was a table right in that corner. And I signed up right there. And you could just feel that adoration that he had for the man and, the, and also feel the spirit of the time. Military training for the balance of the semester will take the place of athletics at Kalamazoo College. Dr. Stutson. I have found many young men anxious to enlist who cannot obtain the consent of their parents. Young men, if you want to join the Army, don't wait. We can take you without your parents' consent if you are 18 years old and can pass the examination. Come and sign up. Private A.B. Peeler, Army Recruiter, Kalamazoo, Michigan. In May 1917, Congress authorized a draft. Within a few weeks, National Guard officers were ordered on active duty and on July 15th, the Michigan National Guard was called into service. Initially, the companies formed in their home armories. On August 16th, all the various companies which composed Colonel Westnage's command departed from their home cities to assemble at Grayling. 5,000 people crowded close to the troop train to wish the men Godspeed. Kalamazoo Gazette. We are going perhaps never to return, and the parting is hard, but a call greater than any other summons us away. Tell our good friends of Kalamazoo that our thoughts shall ever be for those at home whom we go to represent in a world struggle. Ask them sometimes to think of us. Colonel Westnage. Captain Emil Ganser would later write the history of the 126th Infantry. Many a heart throbbed and tears could not be repressed when the departing soldier finally embraced his loved ones for the last time an instant before the train pulled out of the station. The train steamed away amid waving handkerchiefs and flags, the ringing of bells and tooting of shop whistles. And here and there in the crowds could be seen an anxious mother, wife, or sweetheart with bowed head and moist eyes. The day will not soon be forgotten. Captain Emil Gonzer. Mother, arrived here okay, the air is great, nothing but pine trees and soldiers. Private Steve Brody. Many a boy spent hours going all over camp for a pail of taps or to borrow a few yards of guard line for his corporal and other similar missions, all of which was mystifying to the recruit but deemed necessary by the old timers as part of the soldier's training. Captain Gonzer. Charles Bennett, a bugler, began a diary which he would keep throughout the war. They got some rookies to go up in the woods, then caught them with a gunny sack and told them they were under arrest for trying to bag snipes. The sergeant of the guard was wise, and he put them in the guardhouse. Gee, but they were scared, believe me. A Lieutenant Wheeler played the judge. Corporal Sherman was a lawyer, and they made some great plays. They had those rookies scared. Believe me, they all had long faces, for they knew what was coming to them. It was all for their benefit. They tried the first rookie. Talk about a scared lad. He was one. The bag had been found right behind him, and that was against him. He said he didn't know what a snipe was. The judge told him it was the shape of an egg, had eight legs, four wings, 
and two diamond-like eyes. Sergeant Perry said that out west at night, a man would take a snipe bag and a lantern and hide the lantern behind the bag so it wouldn't show, and then have two other fellas drive the snipes into the bag, and that this was all against the law. Charles W. Bennett, Bugler. After a month in Grayling, the soldiers were transported by trains to their next destination. We hit Michigan City about 6 o'clock, and I got off the train there. Some of the boys got pinched for getting booze. We had to lay there until 8 o'clock to get things straightened out. But a girl got my address there, Charles Bennett. After four days, they arrived at Camp MacArthur, a huge, hastily constructed base in Waco, Texas. Boy, we've sure got a great camp. Our mess halls are long enough for 300 men. We've got electric lights on the grounds, and soon we'll have them in our tents. It's only about 300 yards from the mess halls to the latrines, and we've got a big shower for every company. Charles Bennett. There, they underwent further training in the techniques of modern warfare. At Camp MacArthur, instruction was given in bayonet work, target practice, grenade throwing, gas mask use, and trench digging. Dear Mrs. Peck, I am one of the soldiers from Kalamazoo who ate some of your delicious jelly. And seeing your name on the glass, I am writing this to thank you personally. Now I will tell you some of our daily happenings. We drill about eight hours a day. First we have calisthenic exercises, then bayonet drill, then bomb throwing, then lectures, and then we go to the drill field and learn how to kill Germans without a gun. Private Charles Berner. The headquarters company had a kill the Kaiser act tonight. First came the minister, looking very solemn. Then came the band playing a funeral march. Then came a squad of men with fixed bayonets. The Kaiser walked in the middle, downhearted and very white. Next came stretcher bearers. Gee, but it was a sad procession. They said they caught the Kaiser in back, eating some pretzels. So they stood him up and shot him. They put him on a stretcher then and brought him back with the band playing. Finally, somebody hollered, Hey, Kaiser, here's a bottle of beer. Then the Kaiser raised up and answered, Where? At Camp MacArthur, a division of 28,000 men was organized. It would contain four infantry regiments of 7,000 men each. Fifteen companies from southwestern Michigan communities, each of about 300 men, were part of the 126th Infantry, commanded by Colonel Westnedge. The two Kalamazoo National Guard companies were then merged into one. Colonel Joe, as he is affectionately known, is big and broad and strong and amazingly active for his size. His hair is black and his complexion under the Texas sun is like an Indian's. His eyes are saved by a merry twinkle that takes the edge from a sharp tongue. Camp MacArthur correspondent, Grand Rapids Press. A regular army officer, General William G. Hahn, was placed in command of the division designated the 32nd Division. From the beginning, it was one of my principal functions to keep before the eyes of the officers and men the fact that the 32nd Division was going to fight, that all of our training must be conducted with that end constantly in view. General William G. Hahn. In early December, the entire division was inspected by the general staff from Washington who were making a tour of all divisions to determine the order in which they were to be sent to France. And it was said that the division making the best showing would be the first to go. Captain Gonzer. Christmas arrived and was celebrated in Camp MacArthur. The regiment's chaplain, Father Dunnigan, held Christmas services. Toward the latter part of December, the results of the inspection was received in camp 
which reported our division as the most advanced in its training and more completely equipped than any other division in the United States. Everyone felt very proud of this report and rejoiced further still when notice was given that we were to be sent to France at the earliest practicable date. Captain Gonser. Colonel Westnedge wrote to his mother, The time is not far distant when we will be taking our places in the trenches in France. The men have made up their minds to the fact that we must take our part over there, and they're getting trained for it like football men. I will be sorry for the Germans when they are up against our men who will fight to a finish. As 1917 drew to a close, the Allies' situation worsened. The French army mutinied. The British suffered a severe defeat at Ypres. The Italian army was routed and on the brink of collapse, and Russia quit the war. While Americans hastily prepared, their aid loomed as an increasingly important factor. In January, 61 trains began moving the 32nd Division from Camp MacArthur. Camp Merritt, New Jersey was the point of embarkment for the 32nd Division. To help guard against a submarine attack, the actual date of departure was kept secret. Out of the 80 divisions intended to be shipped overseas, they would be the sixth to leave. A small advance party from the 32nd Division left early aboard the Tuscania. Rumor has it that Michigan men are next to sail. The National Guard will be sent to France first. Kalamazoo Gazette. Pandemonium swept Kalamazoo when the Tuscania was torpedoed and sunk. Relatives spent several anxious days before learning that the 126th Infantry had not been aboard. The 126th Infantry actually boarded another transport. Red Cross lady served us with coffee in a bun before getting on. Our boat's a captured German freighter. It's been renamed the President Grant. The last trip they made, they throwed nine men overboard that died of pneumonia. Charles Bennett. Several other transports were part of the convoy. They were painted in every conceivable fashion and color to make it more difficult for submarines to recognize them. The various schemes were a source of interest and amusement. Captain Gonzer. This afternoon I was on the deck when an abandoned ship drill sounded. I made for my station. The deck was crowded and a gun fired. I saw a thing that looked like a periscope and the shells were flying all around it. Our back gun fired twice and then our front gun fired three more times. Then the cruiser turned and fired a broadside. The cruiser kept banging away, and all the ships in the convoy scattered. Finally, the excitement stopped. Whatever they shot at, it was all blowed to hell. Charles Bennett. In early March, the 126th Infantry safely landed in France. General John J. Pershing was the commander-in-chief of the American Expeditionary Forces. He had told President Wilson that in order to win the war, the United States would need to put an 80-division army of 10 million men in France. He had planned that every 6th Division would be used solely to provide replacements for the preceding five divisions. 
When the 32nd Division was the 6th Division to arrive, it was designated as a replacement division and sent to the American base at Saint-Nazir. We had visions of soon being in battle and being real heroes. Instead, we learned that the 32nd Division was not to be a combat organization, but a replacement outfit. That we would be broken up as an organization and reassigned. Captain Charles Myers. No amount of profanity or expletives seemed at all adequate to express one's feelings for such a reception. I proceeded without delay to General Pershing's chief of staff. It was evident to me that unless I could upset these orders, my fine division would be a thing of the past. General Hahn. Coincident with General Hahn's protestations, the Germans mounted a powerful offensive in the spring of 1918. The situation for the Allies appeared critical, and General Pershing received instructions from Washington to make all available troops available to assist the flagging French army. General Pershing wanted to keep all the American troops together. He didn't want them mixed in with French and British armies as such. He wanted them to keep their uh, designation as United States troops and to keep their regiments together and their divisions together. And um, so, because he thought the Europeans, the British and the French, had too much of a defensive attitude. And Pershing said, the whole point is for us to we'll go on the offense. We want to be on the offense. And this spirit was imbued down the line all the way through uh, to the privates uh, in the trenches that uh, we want to get this over. We don't want to sit around like those Europeans have been doing. We want to get out and fight and get it over with. Nobody wants to get killed, but we've got to do our job. After about six weeks, the most pleasant news possible came. The General Han had succeeded in his efforts to have the division rated as a combat organization and that we would leave immediately for the front. Captain Charles Myers. Dear Mother, gee, I wish you could look into our billet and see us. I know you would smile for all the fellows are singing and raising the dickens. They all feel good because we got the news that we're going to move. I don't know where we're going and I don't care just so we get a crack at the Bosch. You don't need to worry about me, for I will come back and tell you all about it. George Ibbotson, Jr. of Kalamazoo with the 126th Infantry. In May 1918, Colonel Joe and his 126th Infantry received orders to board trains bound for the trenches. The trains consisted of the usual springless boxcars labeled 40 ohms or 8 chevaux, 40 men or 8 horses. Captain Gonzer. We're sitting in some of the damnest cars you ever saw. Horse cars. And by the looks of it, the horses just got out. We're packed in so we can hardly sit down. 40 men in a car, 8 men in a seat. We're packed in like sardines in a box. Gee, but this is a pretty country. But it's a hell of a car. Charles Bennett. The front consisted of hundreds of miles of trenches stretching from Switzerland to the English Channel. Most of these lay in France where the German advance of 1914 had stalled. But the line stretched into Alsace, a small area of southern Germany that the French had captured early in the war. It was to this area that the 32nd Division was initially assigned. The 126th Infantry became the first American troops to set foot on German soil when they relieved the French army holding the trenches there. The company was met by French guides who led them toward the front. The system of trenches is most mystifying, to say the least. One can't tell where they lead to, nor whether they parallel the enemy line or how far away his line is. The war had long before settled into a stalemate in this sector, and the 32nd Division's orders were to hold the line while they relieved the French forces. 
Daily shelling and machine gunning of the trenches occurred. Raiding parties into no man's land were staged each night. I went down to Petty Post 10 and got some burnt cork put on my face and started out. We were a very short way from the Hun Trench. They made it pretty hot for us, but I made it back okay with a bunch. Charles Bennett. Besides the Germans, we encountered other enemies in the trenches, namely the rats and cooties. The former were not molested much by the French as they looked upon them as instruments of warning against the presence of poisonous gas. They were quite numerous and some nearly attained the size of a cat. They weren't welcomed by our men and were disposed of at every opportunity. The cooties were a pest that hung on. They made life miserable and shirt reading was a daily routine. Captain Gonzer. Wish I could take a course of treatment for the cooties. Although I'm entirely rid of them at the present, I expect to start scratching as soon as I get back to the line. A soldier would really be lost without his little pets. Private Steve Brody. The main thing that, that made that war so terrible was the hellacious conditions of the war. Um, the, the stench, the uh, trench foot, you know, they hadn't had trench foot before with the men's flesh rotted off because they couldn't get uh, dry boots uh, and had to stay in, the, uh, in some of those trenches that were water was waist high and um, uh, their, their own, only salvation from that was to uh, try to once a day get their feet out of water and massage them and, uh, and dry them off and take a warm pair of socks that they kept in here on their stomach out and put those on and put those wet ones, wring them out and put them into their homemade dryer. But th that's something they weren't used to. The trenches were about seven feet deep and had a step for firing off of which faced the enemy. Communing trenches zigzagged out into no man's land toward the enemy line. These were called petty posts and were occupied during the day by a few men as observation and listening posts. I shot at a sniper. They told me not to get my head over the pit, but I did. A bullet went by my ear, so I got up and shot at him. And then they turned a machine gun on him. I could see him by a tree, but I had to get back, and he was still shooting when I left. Charles Bennett. Private Joseph W. Guyton of Everett, Michigan, became the first casualty of the 126th and the first American to die on German soil when he was killed by a machine gun barrage while manning Petty Post No. 9. From that point on, death would be a constant companion. A raid in our lines was made by the Germans in the early morning hours. The enemy raiding party had come over in the night and lay in waiting in the trench composing the observation post and in shell holes nearby. This advanced post was occupied by our troops in the daytime only. At 5.30 a.m. as the day relief with Lieutenant Carl A. Johnson in the lead approached its post, he was shot in the abdomen and fell. The report of the pistol shot was the signal for the enemy to open the attack. The enemy commenced throwing grenades at the bend in the trench and cut off three men who were following in single file behind Lieutenant Johnson. The men cut off were surrounded and their surrender demanded, but instead they fought with grenades and rifle fire, all the time sustaining a fusillade of enemy grenades. One big German fell from the parapet into the trench when hit by a rifle bullet. Another threw his hands in the air and fell backward from the parapet, dead. The fight put up by the three Yanks attacked from all sides caused confusion and excitement among the enemy raiding party, who were surprised by this unexpected show of resistance. The three Americans finally managed to fight their way back through the trench. A small counterattack was organized and advanced along the trench on both sides of the parapet. When they reached the place where Lieutenant Johnson fell, they found him lying on his back. Besides being shot in the stomach, he had received another shot in the forehead. 
The lieutenant's uniform was stripped of articles of identification and his leather leggings taken, presumably as proof to secure the bonus which German soldiers receive for killing an American officer. Captain Gonser. In the summer of 1918, the Germans had begun an offensive push which stalled 50 miles short of Paris on the Marne River. In the Battle of Chateau Thierry, American and French forces had barely stopped the German advance. The Germans now planned an eastward assault on July 15th to extend their earlier gains. Allied intelligence learned of the attack and planned a counter-assault, not directed at the German front, but at the western face of the salient near Soissons, in an attempt to cut off the attacking forces. This was to be made by the French 10th Army with help from two American divisions. Meanwhile, four other American divisions, including the 32nd, were secretly placed under French command and transported to meet the German offensive. On July 18th, the Allies attacked at both points and a pitched battle ensued. We rode all day without nothing to eat. We went through town after town that had been flattened, past battlefield after battlefield. There were guns, helmets, clothing, everything of all nations strung all over. Hundreds of graves with crosses and helmets on. God, war is hell. Charles Bennett. By July 30th, the German advance had been driven back by the American 3rd and 28th Divisions to a position along the Ork River, where they were determined to make a stand. The 32nd Division replaced the depleted 3rd Division at the river's edge, and an attack was ordered for the next day. We know that we will have to pay the price of victory, and whatever the cost is, we, like the people at home, are willing to pay it and are firmly resolved to stick until the Hun has decided he's had enough and is willing to quit. Colonel Westnedge. I cannot say that I felt any anxiety whatever as to the outcome of the first battle of the 32nd Division. The 3rd Division had made several attempts to take the position and each time had to withdraw. It was too exhausted after its heavy fighting to make another great effort. But our fresh troops went forward as a drill, and never for a moment did I think that they would do anything else. Never for a moment did it occur to me that they might fail in this first attempt. General Hahn. I dreamed I was back home just ready to sit down to the table. It was summer, and at noon, mother and father were there laughing over something, having a good time and all. Gee, but it seemed real. Rain leaking through my tent onto my face finally woke me up. Just then they hollered, fall in, Charles Bennett. I always thought that when we went over the top, we would shake. But all the boys had a smile, and all you could hear them say was, let's go and give them hell. Private Leo Hayward. My father never spoke much to my sister and I about the war. Uh, I think his memories were too traumatic. But he did speak about the, or in his diary, he talked about the men that were with him and uh, when they were ready to get into the trenches in France he said I never thought I had a friend until now and I have everyone here is my friend. On the other side of the river lay a long open slope then a countryside dotted with woods, hills, farms and small villages all heavily fortified. The 126th Infantry crossed the Ork under heavy fire 
and fought their way into the village of Sierge at the base of two large hills. The enemy had placed a large red cross flag in the steeple of the church in Sierge, indicating the location of a first aid station. And as the line approached the town, it was discovered that enemy snipers were located in the church steeple and causing many casualties to our troops. Now these snipers were soon brought to account when our troops entered the town, no quarter being asked and none given. Captain Ganser. The troops hid in shell holes during the night, and the next morning were ordered to renew the attack against the hills and the surrounding woods. For the next three days, the 126th was engaged in a terrific battle for control of the high ground. We went over the hill in two waves. A shrapnel burst near me going up the hill and knocked my gun out of my hands. The men next to me were knocked down. Our runner was hit in the arm and shell-shocked. The rest of us all went on and hid on the other side of the hill. I lay with a dead yank on each side of me. The shells, as we form our lines, are cutting them all to hell. I saw a good many men blow to pieces. I passed a shell hole with a leg and a foot near it. The body was a little farther away. Charles Bennett. We encountered strong machine gun fire, but this didn't stop the advance, and the first line soon came to grips with the enemy and forced him out with the bayonet. Captain Gonser. On August 1st, the fighting was so fierce that nearly one-fifth of the regiment's personnel engaged in the battle were either killed or wounded. No sooner was the enemy cleared out of the woods when he prepared for a counterattack and drenched the western portion of the woods with a terrific shell fire. After the shelling stopped, the enemy advanced in solid formation from two flanks. The contending forces were so close to each other that pistols and bayonets were used. Captain Gonzer. Colonel Joe was with his boys all the way. In the din of the battle, the men could see him on the field. During the thick of it, the colonel was right with us. His clothes were torn almost to shreds. He even refused to take time to shave. No man in the outfit bore a heavier part in the work. Parents of the boys in his outfit will never know how much he should be appreciated. Lieutenant A.H. Fitzgerald. The southern slope of the hill was covered with dead enemy bodies. And in some places they were so thick we had to pick our way through them in advancing toward the woods. Captain Gonzer. The boys were hollering and the Huns shooting flares. I saw Spike and Nick go down. The machine guns were playing on us. I don't see how I got through those bullets. Joe, King, Kleinfelter, and a lot more of my friends were killed. Charles Bennett. It was just unheard of in the French people with, with our, our division. And to see what we accomplished they didn't hardly believe it. And they, they'd never heard of anything such as it is. And that, that's why we got the nickname, Less Terribles. They, it was just un, uh, unbelievable. They, it, wherever we, they put us through that, put the bangle. Because of this drive, the French nicknamed the division Les Terribles. If one uh, looks at what motivates a person to um, come out of a trench and go and face the enemy point blank like they did in World War I, you have to stop back and re reflect what caused them, what, what was in their hearts that, that caused it. We know uh, historically that, and religiously that n no greater love hath any man than to give his life for his friends. 
And, uh, and that's what they did. And probably they didn't think of it as openly as that, but when they were there uh, to do the job and to complete the mission, and there's nothing more important in the military than the mission. Throughout the drive, the conduct of our beloved regimental commander, Colonel Joe, was an inspiration to us all. He shared all the hardships with the men and was always near the front line with little food and such rest as he could get by crouching in shell holes. Captain Gonzer. He shared the privations and dangers of the enlisted men. When blankets were scarce, he slept cold. When food was difficult to get, he ate last and least. Chaplain Donegan. Eventually, the Americans drew back to the edge of the woods, but they had captured the high ground and dug in position for the night. We laid in a ditch with water up to our knees. When we stuck our heads up, the machine gun bullets buzzed by. Charles Bennett, bugler. At 5 a.m. the next morning, which was August 2nd, they stormed the woods again. This time the Germans offered little resistance. Having lost the critical high ground, they began to abandon their positions and retreat. The 126th Infantry, despite its heavy casualties, gave chase and advanced seven and a half kilometers more that day. To cover their retreat, the Germans left machine gun crews in strategic locations. A sergeant observed an undamaged enemy machine gun tipped over on its side. Becoming suspicious, he took a private with him and upon investigation found two enemy machine gunners in a trench with coats thrown over their faces, who to all outward appearances were dead. After deliberation for a moment, they decided to take no chances, so both soldiers fired a shot into the bodies of the Germans. And to their great amazement, found both of them alive and playing possum. The Germans' courage and nerve had to be admired in spite of the fact that they were our enemy. They could have surrendered, yet they were willing to go through their little game and risk all for an opportunity to obtain casualties in our ranks. Captain Gonzer. They took their objective by assault and held it until they got orders to proceed to the next objective and so on, and so on, and so on continuously until eight days later, they had driven the enemy back 19 kilometers and had captured the famous stronghold and railhead at Feem and driven the enemy across the Vessel River. General Hahn. After the eight-day battle, the regiment was relieved. Many of the men had not eaten for days. Equipment was fixed and the soldiers counted. Burial details were assigned. Colonel Westnage's regiment had entered the battle with 3,376 men and in eight days had suffered 882 casualties. Dear Daddy, I am in the hospital. I was not wounded in a way to lose any blood but was what is called shell-shocked. A large shell exploded near me and just about covered me up, but not any of the pieces hit, as luck would have it. Shell-shock is an awful thing, Dad, for it knocks your nerves all to pieces. I wouldn't be any good up on the front again, I don't think, for just the thoughts of a shell whistling my way makes me nervous. A fellow who was on the front as long as we were and who gets out of it without losing any blood is gifted. Private Richard Bogart. My nerves are about gone. We started over to see the graves where Kleinfelter and the others are resting. I got as far as his grave and, and I went down in a nervous fit. And a doctor came along and gave the boys a tag to send me to the hospital. But I didn't want to go, so they brought me back. Charles Bennett. Quentin Roosevelt, an American flyer and the son of former President Theodore Roosevelt, had been shot down earlier in the war in the area now held by the 32nd Division. 
After the Second Battle of the Marne, soldiers in the division located his remains and decorated his grave. When my grandfather was going back behind the lines one time with his platoon, they stopped by Teddy Roosevelt's son's grave. And that, he told me that when he sat there and looked at the grave, he had the feeling that this was a war that involved everybody, not just the farmers like he was. He grew up as a farm boy, that this included presidents and college boys and everybody else was involved in this war. In the ensuing days, the Germans entrenched themselves right where General Hahn and Colonel Westnage had left them, in a line at the Vessel River. The relieving units, the 28th and 77th Divisions, were unable to dislodge them. What finally broke the deadlock was a flanking attack north of Soissons, made jointly by the now depleted 32nd Division and the French 10th Army in late August of 1918. The division, with some companies at only 50% of full strength, had been secretly loaded into French trucks and transported 55 kilometers to the new front. For this engagement, General Hahn and the 32nd Division were placed under the command of the French 10th Army commander, General Magnin. The French say we are funny men not afraid of bayonets, gas, or shells. But of a pick and shovel, they say we're scared to death. Well, they prefer the pick and shovel. Why is it the Americans have got so much more guts than any other nation? Charles Bennett. On August 29th, Les Terribles and the French army attacked the German lines east of Soissons and began five days of furious fighting. After a series of attacks and counterattacks, which involved fierce hand-to-hand -hand struggles, the 32nd Division pushed the elite Prussian guards of the German army back five and a half kilometers and captured the strategic town of Juvigny. I sent Colonel Westman's word that an advance was to be made, and that if he were ready to make an advance, to do so, but that he, as the commander on the field, must use his own judgment in the matter. General Hahn. Colonel Joe is idolized by the men of his regiment. In a fight, he is always found in the front ranks and has been seen on a number of occasions with a rifle going to it for all he is worth. One night, he was discovered completely covered with mud in a shell hole between the lines. He had crawled in the hole after rigging up telephone equipment, and he hid there for 11 hours, sending and receiving messages. Reverend C.W. Merriam, YMCA volunteer. He knew the enemy position by personal observation before ordering an advance. Chaplain Donegan. The guns are going all the time. It's just like thunder. And the shells are hitting too close for comfort. Gas alarms are ringing about every half hour. Dead men and horses are all along the road. The smell just about makes you sick. Oh, God, it's hell. Charles Bennett. A half hour after the time set for the advance, I received a message from Colonel Westnich stating that he had reached his objective and taking a hell of a lot of prisoners. General Hahn. After the loss of Juvigny on their flank, the Germans gave up the Vessel River and retreated to establish new positions. Following this battle, Les Terribles earned another nickname. Since every time they appeared on a battle map, they were accompanied by a red arrow indicating they were piercing the enemy's lines, the 32nd Division became known as the Red Arrow Division. In the fall of 1918, with the Germans regrouping, the opportunity presented itself for the American forces to be brought together and begin an independent assault. General Pershing met with the Allied commander, Field Marshal Foch, and the two agreed the Americans would attack in an area known as the Argonne Forest.
This was to be the largest American effort in the war and the most costly. Over one million American soldiers would be involved, and unlike those in the 126th Infantry, most would be inexperienced. The battle would last until the end of the war and leave over 26,000 Americans dead and almost 100,000 wounded. Colonel Westnedge and the 126th Infantry were to play a key role. The Argonne Forest was a heavily wooded area marked by rugged heights and ridges. After four years of fighting, the Germans had built an extensive defensive system of unusual depth and strength. Their fortified lines ran along the heights, with the most formidable of these being known as the Kriemhild Stellung, or Hindenburg Line. General Pershing planned a massive American assault on the woods with an ambitious timetable that called for the Kriemhilde Stellung to be overrun on the second day. The attack was to rely on surprise and speed, but despite some significant gains on the first day, the huge American army quickly became bogged down. The few supply roads became jammed with men, horses, guns, trucks, and wagons. The Germans put up a stiff resistance, and inexperienced American units at the front became lost and disorganized. After ten days, a stalemate developed, and the Kriemhilde Stellung remained unbroken. General Pershing arranged for the frontline troops to be relieved. Colonel Westnedge and the 126th Infantry found themselves heading into their fourth and final battle. The 32nd Division passed through this woods in a cold downpour of rain. In the darkest night that I have ever seen, or rather felt, at a time when the only trail through no man's land was completely blocked so that the men with their 75 pound packs had to pick their way over tangled wire in mud and under the fire of the enemy's artillery. Yet, there were no complaints. General Hahn. These woods had been subjected to considerable shelling. Shell holes appeared in all directions, and many trees were shattered, leaving only stumps of what was once full-grown oaks and maple trees. These woods had been drenched with gas, much of which in liquid form was still standing in shell holes. The odor from human corpses filled the woods. Captain Gonzer. They started the gas over us. Several other boys and myself got enough gas to last us the rest of our lives. After one got his senses back, a dizzy and nauseated feeling seems to come. The eyes become bloodshot, and there's a most painful coughing. Captain Otto K. Booter. From October 4th through the 13th, a series of unsuccessful attacks were made against the German line. General Pershing believed the key position in the Kriemhilde Stellung was the Côte d'Am Marie, a fortified crescent-shaped ridge with a prominent hill at each tip. He planned for an early morning attack on October 14th in which the 5th and 42nd Divisions would assault opposite ends of the ridge. In order to deceive the German defenders, he ordered the 32nd Division as a decoy to attack three hours earlier in the center of the ridge. General Hahn, Colonel Westnedge, and the men of the 32nd Division did not know they were supposed to be the bait for the trap. Their orders were to take the ridge. I felt that it would be necessary to raise the morale of our troops to the very highest pitch. To make them believe that not only must the position be taken, but we would take it. That nothing in front of them would stop them. General Hahn. Colonel Westnage came to me when we were securely placed in our positions. In his characteristic way, he said, everything is set. That was his moment of prayer. 
and he consecrated the regiment to the will of the Infinite Father, Chaplain Donegan. On October 14, 1918, at 5.30 a.m., with the 127th on their left and the 128th on their right, the 126th Infantry went over the top against the center of the Côte d'Anne-Marie, as ordered. They were met by heavy machine gun fire at the edge of the enemy's barbed wire entanglements. The boys fell on all sides of me, and I almost went crazy with madness. But we went on and on, and not even hell could have stopped us. Private Bernard Williams. Gradually came reports from various parts of the front. A message was received that the 127th Infantry had gone against heavy fire in the woods and was stopped. Then another message. The 128th was also held up. General Hahn. Meanwhile, with the German forces engaged in the center, the 5th and 42nd Divisions launched their attack as planned. However, the envisioned pincer-like movement proved too difficult to execute, and all three divisions soon found themselves pinned by heavy fire directed down at them from the fortified heights of Côte d'Anne-Marie. What changed the course of the battle was an act of desperation. Colonel Westnedge, after several attempts to get the 126th Infantry through a gap in the wire, sent Captain Edward Strom and seven men forward to take the machine guns which covered the gap. Under heavy fire, the patrol worked their way up the steep slope until they were within 150 yards of the guns. Using rifle grenades, they attacked the positions and rushed the survivors. Within minutes, they had captured 10 machine guns and 15 prisoners. The rest of the 126th Infantry followed into the ridge. Amazingly, they sustained no casualties. My corporal fell dead in my arms, and we stormed the machine gun nest that got him. 15 of us rushed into the deadly sheet of fire, but only five reached it. What we did to them, I cannot tell. Private Bernard Williams. It was almost too good to be true. News came to the effect that the 126th Infantry had breached the Hindenburg Line. General Hahn. To the right of center, the 128th Infantry were now able to work their way behind enemy positions. 200 prisoners were quickly taken when they realized they were surrounded. Where's your colonel? asked a general officer inspecting the line in the Argonne. Up ahead was the answer. Where's his headquarters? Up ahead, repeated the soldier. Always ahead, with the cutting edge of the 32nd Division bent deepest into the enemy resistance, Colonel Westnage led the attack. Chaplain Donegan. On the left, the 127th Infantry began to move around the side of the ridge. That night they ascended to find the remainder of the Côte d'Anne-Marie deserted by the enemy. It would take the 5th and 42nd Divisions two more days to reach their objectives. But the decoy, the 32nd Division, with the capture of the dominant heights, had already succeeded in decisively cracking the Hindenburg Line. Colonel Joe came out of the fight with a 10 days beard, blood in his eye and the whole seat of his trousers missing. Captain Otto K. Booter. The thing that they hold Colonel Weston so much in adoration for was his ability to identify with them. Um, that doesn't necessarily always make a great leader, but it certainly helps. And that uh, uh, whenever, whatever you read, you see uh, the, whatever the troops were doing, he was doing. And he was there with them. He was visual. He was seen by everyone. He wasn't ba back just making strategic plans in some dugout and issuing orders somewhere. That was uh, all right by, based on his firsthand experience. My sympathy is with those whose loved ones have fallen on the fields of France. But they can all know and feel that the men of the 126th who have paid the big price 
did it with their faces the right way and were taking the fight to the enemy like true Americans. Colonel Westnedge. I was sent on burying detail. Buried 20 in the first trench, seven in the next one, and 26 in another. We worked like the deuce. Charles Bennett. Father Dunnigan wrote to the families. My dear Miss Farrell, this letter was on the body of Corporal Ebbetson, who was killed in action at the front in France. I buried him today. Dear Maggie, this is Sunday night and just about the time that I always came to see you. I wish I was there tonight just to walk in and surprise you. I would like to take a walk down and get some ice cream. It's so long since I've had any that I don't know what it is anymore. With love, George. Elsewhere, the German army was losing a war of attrition. They had no reinforcements. On fronts with the Belgians, French, and English, they began yielding ground. Sensing the inevitable, the German high command began to press for peace. Though the war would continue for a couple of weeks more, the end was in sight. On October 20th, the 32nd Division was relieved from the Argonne Forest after gaining eight and a half kilometers in 21 days of continuous fighting. A delousing station was established and everyone given the opportunity to obtain a bath and clean underwear. We felt like human beings once more. Captain Gonser. On November 1st, the 126th Infantry was redeployed in anticipation of a new American offensive, and Colonel Westnedge was taken ill. He had been sick during the final days of battle. The regimental sergeant had urged him to go back for rest and treatment. The colonel, who had never used the privileges of his rank, remained with his men. Chaplain Donegan. On November 6th, Colonel Westnedge who had never missed a day of duty, reported to the hospital with a severe cold, aggravated by gas burns he had received earlier. The 126th Infantry re-entered the front lines, but an agreement between the warring powers had been reached. On the 11th day of the 11th month at 11 a.m., the fighting would cease. On that day at 10.30 a.m., Sergeant Major Percy Baldwin of Grand Rapids became the last battle casualty of the regiment when he was struck by shell fire. A half hour later, the war ended. Dear Mother, while the war is over and we sure are glad, many things have taken place since the day the war was called off. The Germans come over and trade cigars for our tobacco. They are the happiest bunch you ever saw. The front lines look like a 4th of July celebration. The sky is all lit with flares and stars. You can hear a bunch of Germans singing, then some of our boys. It sure is wonderful. When our band gets through playing, we can hear the Germans cheer from across the river. Private John DeBoer. Before coming home, the 32nd Division was assigned to occupation duty in Germany. After a long march through France and Luxembourg, the division entered Germany on December 1st. It was while in Germany that word was received that Colonel Westnage's condition had worsened. He had developed tonsillitis. His breathing became difficult, and on November 26th, he had died. It struck the regiment like a thunderclap in every orderly room or billet and the officers' mess or mess lines. The words and sorrowful tones could be heard. Colonel Joe is dead. Captain Gonzer. 
Well do I remember the morning the report came to our ears. It was difficult for us to believe that Colonel Westnage, who had escaped all the dangers of battle, which he had shared unflinchingly with his men and his officers, had died. Chaplain Dunnigan. Dear Mrs. Westnage, I have only just learned of the death of Colonel Westnage, and I hasten to express to you my sincere sympathy. Colonel Westnage commanded his regiment very ably and bravely. I consider during the whole of the fighting that Colonel Westnage was one of the strongest characters and one of the best regimental commanders on the front. General Hahn. Dear Mrs. Westnage, before my letter reaches you, you will have received official notice of the Colonel's death. Even when he was ill, he showed the greatest consideration for the nurses. We were very fond of him, and everyone did what they could to make his last days comfortable, and we considered it a privilege to serve him. He often spoke of you and the children, and wished he might see you again. He was laid to rest in the American cemetery just outside the city of Nance. The sun shone for the first time in many days. The coffin was draped with old glory and borne on a French caisson, escorted by French and American soldiers. As we passed through the streets of Nance, the Frenchmen uncovered their heads. Soldiers stood at attention and women and children made the sign of the cross and offered a prayer for the departed soul of an American hero. One woman, whose face bore traces of her sorrow, stepped forward and placed a bouquet of white chrysanthemums on the coffin. The cortege halted a moment, then passed on. Three volleys were sounded over the open grave and taps sounded from the neighboring wood. The flowers enclosed are from his grave. With deepest sympathy, sincerely, Catherine L. McIver, Red Cross Nurse, Base Hospital 11, Nance, France. In the spring of 1919, in preparation for returning home, the survivors of the 32nd Division were reviewed and inspected. General Mognan, whose French army had fought alongside the 32nd Division in the attack at Soissons, presented the division with the Croix de Guerre. General Pershing gave a farewell address. When America entered the war, we found our allies in a very low state. Those nations doubted whether they would be able to withstand another onslaught. But our entry gave them new hope, filled them with fresh determination. You came to the battlefield at a crucial hour of the Allied cause. It has been a very great honor for me to command you. And now that it is time for the division to break up and the men to go to their homes, I can only hope that you will go back possessing the same spirit of idealism with which you fought. For this splendid work, I thank you sincerely, General Pershing. During eight months in France, the 32nd Division had fought in three major offensives and suffered 14,000 casualties. In April, the survivors of the 126th Infantry boarded the Francis J. Luckenbach and returned home. When I was growing up, my grandfather was an important part of my life. What he, his values were and what they meant to him were passed on down to me. And he talked about what it meant to fight for something, that the country meant a lot to him, that those sacrifices that those guys made during World War I were worth something, that the country was worth dying for and fighting for. Two years after the end of the Great War, Colonel Westnage's body was disinterred from its resting place in France and returned to the United States for reburial in Kalamazoo. Two years later, there has been um,
Colonel Joe's body has been interred and it's going to be brought back to Kalamazoo to be buried at Riverside Cemetery. And that day, everything closed down in Kalamazoo. Thousands of people lined the street out of respect to Colonel Joe as the body was brought from the train um, back up to its final resting place in the cemetery. Nothing like that had ever happened before. Here was a man who everybody either knew or knew of. Throughout the war, he was associated with, with the Red Arrow unit. It would be stories about Colonel Joe doing this, Colonel Joe doing that. So I think it really personalized this for a lot of people. We need to remember these men that fought because of the responsibility they took and how they learned to survive by each other's help. And they felt that they needed to stick together and look after each other and still get the job done. This program was made possible by generous grants from the Irving S. Gilmore Foundation and the Arts Council of Greater Kalamazoo, committed to promoting the arts and culture to the Kalamazoo community.